Hey guys, this is Lucid. Welcome to this video. We're going to be talking about salting the earth. And the reason we're going to be talking about it is this is going to be a follow on from kind of the discussions we've been having on game theory and how that relates to something like a free for all multiplayer game like Dominions. So buckle down and uh, hopefully this will be a little bit fun. The, the reason we're talking about this is because this video I put up a few days ago, a story of stupidity and salt. It generated a fair amount of controversy, which was kind of interesting. And then on my Discord, there's a lot of discussion about it. A lot of people didn't agree with some things I said. Uh, a lot of people did agree. But there was also, I think it, it was kind of interesting because it made me, you know, after the video was released in some ways, have to articulate certain things in a certain kind of logic that I think was very useful for me. Like it was, it was a, it's kind of, I think it's in some ways like the good side of online debating. Like a lot of times online debating kind of descends into like bombastic statements and this, that, and the other. And, you know, I mean, everybody knows how that works on Facebook and politics. And it, it descends into dribble. This did not, and I don't know why. <laughs> but people had very, like in the comments even of the videos, people, even if they weren't right, they had very well thought out and thoughtful comments that they put. And I read through all of them. I uh, responded to a lot of them. So, yeah, we're going to be... We're going to be talking about salting the earth because this is one of the things that people were saying was like uh, hypocrisy, right? Like if somebody else salts the earth, they're a stupid noob. If Lucid does it, then it's righteous, right? And people said basically the same thing about trying to win the game. And what I will show you by the end of this is how that detour to burn the monkey towns to the ground while you can't prove any, you know, I mean, I, I can't talk about some future that didn't happen. I will show you how that was actually playing to win on my side. And I said some things in the video, like I'm not playing to win. And, <laughs> but I'm going to show you how it actually was playing to win. However, just my personality type in playing Dominions, um, I was probably going to go a little bit overboard. Like the... <laughs> We'll get into it later, but the punishment aspect, there's a punishment aspect that I was doing that actually is playing to win. But I was going to take that a bit to an extreme, and I was seeing some red, that's for certain. Um, but I was seeing red doing something that my logical mind was telling me I needed to do. And we'll, this will kind of come out at the end. But anyway, right now we're actually going to start with a very simple example that's going to make it seem like I acted incorrectly. And the simple example is this. A simple example is in your one, you're in a 1v1 duel, right? So we've got player A and we've got player B. And they start, they finish expansion and then uh, they start fighting each other. And so this is a 1v1 duel. No other players on the map. Player B takes a fort here from player A. It was player A's, but they take it from them. But now player A has a big army coming and it's clear to player B they're not going to be able to hold it. And they're not sure, they don't think they can, they have some other army they can muster to come and take it back real quickly. Should they burn it or should they not? Should they salt the earth or should they not? And in this case, well, think about what you think the answer is. The answer is that they should burn it. And because if they burn it, by burning it, they weaken player A's position and they improve their position relative to player A. Player A would get this fort, it would improve the player A position substantially, and yeah, so they should do it, right? This, the reason this works is because this is a zero-sum game in the sense that if I take, if I, anything I deny to player A is essentially the same thing as improving my own position by that amount, and that is true. That is completely true. And in some ways, Dominions, once you get very deep in the late game, and there's only two or three players left, it starts to become more like this. However, that is not how Dominions is for most of the game. For most of the game, it is a very large free-for-all game. So we're going to come back and talk about this later in the much more complicated example of a free-for-all game. But next, so this is one, we're, we're going to call this uh, zero-sum like when we're kind of referencing this. This is like a zero-sum mindset that is practical and it makes sense 
when you actually are in a zero sum game. But this is this is what we're talking about. So uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is our f- every veteran Dominion's player's favorite thing, which is land underwater relationships. And this is the underwater, and this is the land. So it always sucks when you realize you're, well, not always. Some nations can actively, very few, but some land nations in Dominions can go successfully invade underwater. It's one of the things I'll say I like about Dominions Enhanced is I do like the item price rebalancing that lets land nations go underwater. You know, if it would ever get implemented in vanilla, maybe it gets toned down a little bit from where DE, DE is, but I think it's pretty good actually. And if it were implemented like that in vanilla, I think it would be a good thing. However, anyway, I, I do like that. So in DE, you can actually kind of conquer underwater. It's difficult and it's going to be way more expensive than otherwise, you know, than most other land nation matchups, but you can do it. In vanilla, you kind of can't for most nations. And so the dynamic that you tend to end up getting is that the underwater nation will either do two things. They're either going to say, you are pretty weak and we're going to come in proper and we're going to conquer you, right? We're going to do a proper invasion. We're going to send doomstack armies and we're going to outright kill you. And this is the thing that happens. A lot of times it's kind of hard to do for underwater nations if they're like equally strength and skilled in what is a land nation. A lot of land nations can repel a full on underwater attack. They're just a little bit better on land. There are exceptions to that certainly like, you know, Yis comes to mind. Yis can kind of mop the floor with a lot of land nations pretty pretty early in the game. And then certainly as the game goes later, depending on the tech that people have chosen and other things, you know, underwater can actually have a good matchup and have a very good shot at coming in and killing land nations. But a lot of times this doesn't seem immediately possible, the coming in. And, the, you know, one of the things that also tends to happen a lot in underwater land matchups is a lot of times the land players will be bigger, you know, because maybe there's way more land on the map not per player, but total. And so after first wars, a lot of times the, the land player will be significantly bigger, which makes another barrier to this type of underwater invasion of the land, a direct assault, impractical. The other possibility, and this is the one that, I, I, I think the land players, before we move on to the other possibility, I think land players don't exactly mind this. This is annoying. But it's not uh, like an underwater player who's just going to come out of the water, try to kill you. And if you kill his armies, he goes back in and leaves you alone. That's not really the kind of thing that like is cancer that people hate. I mean, people don't love it. And one of the reasons people don't love it is because if this was a land neighbor and they did that, they come in, they attack you, they get your armies killed. A lot of times you would turn around and use this to your advantage and then go kill them and take their land. A lot of times you're not going to be able to do that in a land underwater matchup. So what then happens, the other option, is that they say, okay, well, we're not going to come in and cap you. We're going to come in and take your land. We're going to treat all of your land that's anywhere sort of close to our coast as a timeshare. And we're going to come in. We're going to take part of the timeshare. And we're going to leave. Now notice, we're not talking about denying resources yet. None of this is coming up. And the underwater nation doesn't want to come in and burn your land. That's usually not the goal. The goal of raiding is to extract, to basically have a timeshare, right? To extract resources from your coastal lands so you have to share it with them. And by share, I mean let them have 100% of it unless you raid back. And the calculus if we want to call it that, that the underwater player is doing, is they're saying, how much is it going to cost me for the raiding parties I send? And how likely are those raiding parties to die versus how much income I'm able to extract from raiding activities? So the more the land player can do to increase the attrition of raiding parties to make it so that they hold the coastal land less, it's, you know, the, the more they can make them hold the coastal land, the, the, the less time they hold the, co- the coastal land, the less incentivized underwater is going to be to continue doing this. But it's very possible that it still makes sense for the underwater to do some raiding. And let's think about this case. Let's say underwater is raiding you, and so you do the best thing you can, which is you have a bunch, as the, the green player, you have a bunch of different squads, which you'll position on the coast to intercept raiders, 
and they're mage supported and they're all of different sizes and compositions so it'll be hard to counter and you keep rotating them around in some random fashion and sometimes you keep them still and you're trying to and not all provinces will have it you know it's a little bit a whack-a-mole thing trying to guess where these things are going to come up and you know you're you're trying to catch all these raiders but you're you know doing a significant commitment right to do against like a proper underwater nation this will actually be a pretty sizable commitment it might be sizable enough that you really wouldn't be able to conduct a major war on another front, depending on how intense the underwater raiding is. Because, you know, uh, the underwater raiding, like, let's say you just put, like, a couple mages here, a small army, right, like, ten troops and a couple mages. That may be enough to deter a lot of raiding. But if that's what all these parties are, is ten troops and a couple mages, then all of a sudden underwater starts moving in with small armies of, like, you know, ten mages and, you know, sixty troops. And they'll kill yours with almost no losses. Right? So you can see kind of how this escalates. And as that happens, you know, you would then have to commit more and more and more. And this, and these small armies, like, you know, 80, 60 troops and 10 mages isn't going to, like, come and take a fort necessarily. I mean, they could start to threaten it. But as a war like that escalates, it can be very expensive for the land nation. So... So what you can basically get into is this, and this would take significant resources from both sides. This is after some escalation. And it depends on how all of this resource trading is happening. Because as things are escalating, the land nation might be able to make it such that this is still a highly unprofitable endeavor for underwater, even as underwater escalates. In fact, maybe even more so as underwater escalates because the land nation correctly anticipates the escalation and puts more intercepting parties out of the right size to repel the underwater invasion. All right. So this can continue for quite a while and it can escalate. However, let's say it reaches a point where the underwater is like, eh, eh, okay. I don't think this is really worth it. Then what happens? Well, these land nations are sitting here and potentially if it's reached this point, they're pretty expensive. And the land nation, this is not a way to win the game, by the way, as a land nation. This is a way to not lose the game. And that's important. <laughs> the land nation is not happy about this. They don't like this situation at all. They are, are they playing to win? I mean, yeah, but they're not doing anything to win. They are not marching closer to the goalpost of winning. They are keeping from losing, right? And they're probably very upset about having to do this. They do not like this at all. This is like, this is like, you know, lots and lots of, there's like a big old salt pile here. So the, let's say, but anyway, they've, they've done a good job defending themselves. They convinced underwater that it doesn't seem to be very profitable. And underwater stops raiding them for like four turns. And after four turns of keeping a significant number of mages outside of forts, you know, whether they're patrolling or whether they're out in open country and significant parts of their army out here that are now not doing anything productive, they're just sitting here and they're, you know, the mages aren't researching or anything. Like, okay, fine. Okay, it looks like we finally shown the fish. And so they get rid of them. These, do I have a way to make this brush bigger? I don't think I do. They get rid of, of these garrisons. And upon getting rid of them, the underwater's like, oh, well. And, and remember, this is how this underwater nation is looking at the board. They're like, oh, well, there's a timeshare slot available. Let's make sure to get it. And so they go and poke. They go and poke. And they take a little bit more. And what they end up doing is they end up settling into this kind of weird equilibrium. And the weird equilibrium is this. It's that if the land nation is putting a ton of stuff here, if the land nation is willing to escalate, the underwater nation knows it's not worth it. And so they stop. But every time the land nation doesn't um, escalate, they sit here and exert a little tax. And so it's like a back and forth thing. This is like, this is kind of the worst for a land nation. Right, because it's like you this coastal land which you want to be generating resources from you, it feels like it's not generating anything. It feels like you're having to commit all of this stuff over here, and the land isn't really generating that much. It feels horrible. But the solution is certainly not to give it to underwater. Yuck. Alright. So then what do you do as the land nation? 
you are involved, as you realize, in an asymmetrical war. Because even though you can kill all the raiders, you can't come over here and kill the underwater nation. And that's very frustrating. So what do you do? The belief system that the underwater nation has is that, well, you have a little bit of resources over here and we'll come exert a tax on it. All right, I had to step away for a minute. <laughs> so I paused the video. So yeah, underwater is planning on coming over and getting their tax. And what can the land nation do about that? If this seems to be a profitable setup, if ever annoying for the land nation. Well, he's in this asymmetrical relationship. And what he needs to do is to make it symmetrical because the mindset of the underwater nation is this is free money. Why would I not take it? And in this case, what he needs to do is he needs to make some kind of uh, cost to raiding him. He needs to have ways to raid underwater. Right? The problem with raiding underwater is unless he can kill the underwater nation, he's probably going to have difficulty holding it in the long run. So this is not really like new land nation borders. This is like kind of the same thing, but in reverse with, with the underwater nation raiding him. You might be like, okay, the, the problem with this though, is a lot of times it's, it's very difficult to do cost efficient raiding from land underwater. You're almost, it's almost always going to be a resource net negative. However, the, if the goal of this isn't so much resource extraction, because it's very difficult, like I said, to do cost-efficient resource extraction from land raiding underwater, if the goal of it instead is to make an incentive for the underwater nation to say, hey, this actually isn't as profitable as I thought, because not only it, you know, do I lose these raiding parties and stuff coming on land, but hey, this is actually cutting into my income if I would have been at peace. So land returning grading, even if it's not exactly profitable, uh, you don't want to obviously devastate yourself. It starts to establish a symmetry in the relationship. And that will change the mindset potentially of underwater. But if we go further, because the goal of this, because the goal of this raid is really not resource extraction. The goal of the raid is resource denial. It makes sense that while you're here, if nobody's coming, and because you're not going to be able to hold this in the long term, it makes sense to burn this to the ground, right? To, to pillage this and to burn it. And of course it's underwater, so you can't do that. I don't know what pillaging underwater is like, but yeah. I, do you dump a bunch of extra salt in there? Or what do you do? Kill all the fishes? I have no idea. But you can do it. It's a command in the game. So if you pillage underwater, maybe you kill all the plankton, put a bunch of bleach in the water. Who knows? If you pillage underwater, you are going to deny resources to the underwater nation. And that is going to go even farther towards your goal as a land nation, which your goal as a land nation is not to pillage underwater. This is not an end in and of itself. Your goal as a land nation isn't to deny resources to underwater. This also is not really a goal. The goal of the land nation is to establish sy symmetry and to get the underwater nation to leave them alone for a very long time. And this is one of the things y'all will have seen me for, for certain if you've watched a lot of my series going like red-eyed, like, oh my God, I hate underwater so much. I'm, we're going to destroy them and burn things to the ground and stuff. And um, getting messed with by underwater is not fun. And it's like this little, it's this person who thinks they're just going to fuck with you. It's really annoying. It's really annoying. And so it is kind of rage inducing. And, and I do, I think I'm by, anytime I can punish some mindset like that, I think I'm biased towards it. However, it is founded on like ex extremely solid logical foundations. Now, how much you pillage and how far you go, you know, cause like, I think the thing is you don't want to see so red that you forget why you're here, right? Like if you're here and you're pillaging stuff, and they're like, okay, fine, peace. And you're like, no, I haven't taught him enough of a lesson. Which, by the way, is actually 
potentially true. Like you do probably need to pillage enough that there's some symmetry that's been done. But if they're telling you, like, it, there's ways to test that though. So like, let's say you've pillaged some, but you haven't pillaged very much. And very quickly, once they see you're doing this, they're like, okay, fine, we can have peace. There's ways to test this, right? Like you could say, okay, I want peace and I want 10 gems for all the stupid underwater gear I had to build to pillage your shit. Cause I wouldn't have had to do this anyway. And if they said yes to that, that would be like a sign that they really realize it's, you know, 10 gems is not much, right? But it's a sign that they've realized that this was an expensive operation, you know, but then you might get into a bit of a pissing match and you might have to spend even more gems to pillage more stuff, but then they would probably give you those 10 gems, or at least a reasonable player would, because they did make you do this. And you can say they didn't make you do anything. I, I mean, they made it where this was the best. They, in the game theory sense, they made you do it. They made it so that this was the best move you could make. Otherwise you'd just be getting fucked with underwater the whole time. So they, in a game sense way, they made you do it in a game theory since they made you do it. So the other way to test it is to ask for something that you really want and see if they'll give it to you. So you could say, okay, we're going to go back to peace. What I want is I want like 15 turns of you not messing with me. And I want, you know, a nap three. And this is a decent way to get a non-aggression power packed out of an underwater neighbor. So I think this is pretty interesting because this is this resource denial, this because this is basically resource denial too, destroying a fort that we were looking over here in the zero sum game world. This resource denial and this resource denial are done for very different reasons. This resource denial does not improve the position of the land nation materially at all, really. Right. If there's 12 players on the board denying, you know, three provinces of income from an underwater nation doesn't really improve his position that much, like almost none from a material sense. He's not any richer. In fact, it hurt his position. He had to spend a lot of gems. He probably lost a fair number of troops. He had to do a lot of things, which if you're looking at it, like if here's the goal, of winning the game, right? This is the goal of winning the game, and this is the path to winning the game. And you are right here, right? And you're thinking, I'm gonna march on this path up to winning. This, coming in here and pillaging stuff is not that. What has happened is that you're marching on this path, and there is a big, underwater roadblock here and says if you go do anything else and commit other stuff we're going to come in and take your shit or tax it to hell it's very hard to win with an underwater nation doing this to you right but they're doing it to, i mean they have to do it to, they're playing an underwater nation this is kind of the game right they they have to do it to somebody right they're not being immoral by doing this i mean they're being a little shit by picking an underwater nation um, especially, oh my god, underwater nations who are the only underwater nation in the game. Mm, yuck, yuck, yuck. But anyway, I mean, it's not immoral. But, I mean, some people, by the way, in the Dominions community would say it is immoral to be an underwater nation and shame on you. And a lot of veteran players will not want to play at all with underwater nations, which is interesting because you would think veteran players would be like, well, like, we can deal with whatever comes. But like, eh, it's not. <laughs> I'm not that way. I, I, I kind of, I don't know. I, I don't like banning things from the game very much. I kind of like letting, it, it's just kind of fun to feel the full cancer and experience of vanilla a lot of times. So anyway, the underwater does this. They put a big roadblock here and it says, you're not going to be able to march on this path because we're going to be fucking with you. And what you basically have to do is you have to take this detour, right? Where you come down here and you're backtracking, you're getting farther away from your goal. So you're not really getting closer to winning. Like doing this, saying I'm going to stop whatever I'm doing that was going to maybe be a profitable war taking me closer, like everybody else in the game, hopefully, you know, closer to, to winning, you know, my graphs are gonna be going up, whatever. Instead of doing that, I'm going to come fuck with you. I'm going to come make this so not worth your time that you know, you're going to beg me for peace. 
and I've said this to underwater nations before. I, like by the time I'm done with you, you are going to be begging me for peace. And I've had it done to me several times where the underwater nation was like, please, okay, let's have peace. I'm done. Did I want to do any of that? No. There was some catharsis when you're in a very stressful situation and you're, I mean, this is not a situation a land nation wants to be in, right? So when you're in this situation and it's very stressful and the underwater is being all big and blustery, like, oh, we're just, who said it's your land? We're going to take it, right? And and then when you turn around and they're, you know, 10 turns later, they're begging you for peace because you've destroyed the population in all of the underwater coastal provinces. You've destroyed a couple of their forts. You've been casting un, uh, unrest remotes at their, at their capital. Anytime something's out in the open, you go to pick it off. You're just basically doing everything you can to make this extremely unprofitable for them. Now, you need to be in a position in the game of strength enough to do that. Otherwise, you know, you're obviously not going to be able to make this extremely costly for underwater if they're outmatching you in strength or something. So anyhow, this still, by the way, is, the is a path to winning. It's just a much slower and longer path, but it's not a path you can avoid, right? So this is, and this is kind of like the whole idea of game theory is it's not what you, it's, it doesn't only matter what you decide, it matters what other people decide. And that's why it can be really frustrating in games because other people are making decisions for you, if that makes sense. And that was actually something that happened in the comments a lot. People would say, you know, you didn't, they didn't decide this, you did. But in game theory, they actually do kind of decide it. I mean, you always have agency on your side. But certain types of things are just ruled out when they make their decision. And veteran players a lot of times are going to try to stay away from lose-lose. They're going to try to be in a position where they're winning a lot. And sometimes in a war, it's going to be a win-lose, right? So a veteran player likes win-loses where they win wars, but they also like win-wins. What veteran players typically do not like is lose-loses. and. A lot of times newer players don't really understand either the logic or the circumstances or a bunch of other things that end up making them kind of do lose-loses all the time. And that's why it's like I was so frustrated because, and I, I can't explain it to them. So maybe in some ways this video is like a shot at how I can explain it to people who refuse to listen. Because I think that's the other thing that happens in a game. I know we're going on a detour here, but that's another thing that happens in a game is somebody who you're at war with or trying to be at war with, you may not listen to them. You don't really hear what they're saying. So like if, if somebody's at war with me and I'm telling them something, they may not listen. You know, they may be like, ah, oh, he's just bullshitting me or whatever. And I, I think that's one thing veteran players do really well is they listen. I, like a new player is worried, like if they actually really listen and take seriously what somebody's telling them, they'll get like bamboozled, right? And a veteran player will listen and they're not worried about being bamboozled because they have strong opinions of their own that usually are somewhat correct, <laughs> you know? But a new player, they don't really know anything, so they don't... They may have opinions, but they're not very strong and they're kind of like, they don't want other things to come in and knock their strong opinions out because they don't want to be taken advantage of in diplomacy, I think. Th this is my speculation. So anyway, anyway, so this is still a path to victory coming over here and burning this underwater stuff. And it's actually a required path, potentially. This normal path that you want to take is not there. You have to take a long detour where you get farther and farther away from winning so that you can come forward. So what is the objective? We've already said, this is a very different burning than the zero-sum burning of a fort. We're denying resources to the enemy player. In fact, pillaging, because this is fort burning, it's a little different, but pillaging, if there was some land I knew I wouldn't keep, and I was player B, I knew I wouldn't keep it for a long time and it was really juicy, you could pillage it in a duel. And that's a, a good move because you've denied resources from player A, and in a zero-sum game where y'all are in a forever war, and nothing's and you're and by the time you conquer a because in a, you know, like even in a free-for-all game you'll be in you know essentially a forever war with somebody you still don't burn the, the land because whoever wins wants it right so why would i burn your stuff if the whole point of the war was to take it from you right because it's going to be my stuff right and if i lose and i get kicked out of the game 
and it's your stuff, I mean, who cares? Because, like, why would I have burnt it? Because if, however, I was able to turn it around, it would have then been mine. But in a duel, by the time the game is over, you've won. Like, by the time you've killed them, it, you've won. So how, whether you burn stuff or not to get there doesn't matter. Right? In a free-for-all game, even if you're locked into a 1v1 duel, by the time it's over, you've got to go fight your next war. And if you burnt and pillaged all of your, you know, the guy you were fighting their land into, to, to the dust, good luck in the next war. You're going to be in some deep shit. Right? So, but anyway, the point is, is that in a zero-sum mindset, anything you do to hurt another player improves your position. However, this is done for a totally different reason. This is not done for resource denial to improve your position because it doesn't do that. It hurts your position. Spending these resources, raiding land you can't keep, takes you farther away from your goal. And by the way, I'm showing you this path like this is the path to victory. There's another path where you go, let's say, do this exact same thing with another land neighbor. You go off and pillage and burn shit and do some war that you're not going to win or keep. This isn't the path to victory. This is just the path of being a fucking idiot and, you know, whatever, right? Like, there are so many of these paths you can take, and being a good Dominions player is not walking down them, right? That, like, being a good Dominions player means walking towards victory as best you can manage in a very complicated and changing world, right? So, um, that is why, I, and that's why, like, in the, the previous video, I said, like, I'm not playing to win right now. Like, I, I'm, and, and that's kind of a lie, because I kind of was playing to win, but I was willing to sacrifice a large portion of my position to come exact punishment. And we're not even to that part where we're talking about punishment yet. Because this isn't even really punishment. This is establishing symmetry. And that is, it's related to punishment. But anyway, we'll get there. So, it's, it's actually pretty closely related. But anyhow, the goal of this, like I said, not resource denial. What is the goal, guys? It's a diplomatic goal. And I think one thing that, this from my previous life in consulting, but one thing that I think is important to think about is if you focus, like, let's say there's this relationship and you're focused on what you want, which is you want a non-aggression pact with the underwater nation. You want them to leave you alone. And that's all you focus on. Like, give that to me, give that to me. You will never get it. What you have to focus on is the mindset that they have. They have a belief system that makes it reasonable for them to do the actions they're doing. And in this case, the belief system that the underwater has is I'm playing an underwater nation like an underwater nation. My job is to tax the land around me because it's an asymmetrical war and I need to take advantage of that, right? And until you start raiding them underwater and pillaging their stuff and casting remotes at them, that's going to, that is true. They are right in their head. There's nothing coming out in their experience that is violating that belief system. So because they have that belief system, they are never going to give you a non-aggression pact. So you can ask for it as much as you want. You can ask for it as nice as you want. You can be as sweet and charming as you want. Nothing you do along those, and I mean, this is people, right? So people can do anything, right? And they could, you know, some people, maybe if you're nice enough to them, will, would stop rating you because you said, pretty please. I've never seen that, but you know, it could happen. What you have to do is you have to change a switch and think of it like there's a switch in their head and you have to flip it. And that switch in the head is, oh my God, there actually is a cost. I thought this was an asymmetrical war. I thought doing this was free, but it's not. There's a cost. And until you switch that, uh, until you flip that switch, you can expect they're going to do the same thing, right? So that is what this action does, is once you have done this, once you have burnt enough shit to the ground, you have flipped that switch in the enemy player's head where you've made them realize, okay, there is a cost and I'm going to acknowledge that and leave you alone because this thing definitely is not worth it. Now we get into, I, I want to trace back now to threats and to, because that's something I do a fair amount of. And threats sound big and bad. Like you'll hear me be like, oh, we're going to you know, burn this thing to the ground and I can't believe this. This asshole is forcing me to do this stupid stuff. 
and you know like the the fish and and the ohm game i can't believe this you know we're going to I, there, there's gonna not going to be any fish swimming in the seas around england you know we're going to kill all the fish we're going to pillage it it's going to be zero population he's not even going to be able to move armies through there make all these threats those, by the way, were not hollow threats. Those were threats I fully planned on carrying out. But why, why be all big and billowy and blustery about it? The reason is very simple. The reason is I don't want to carry those out. I absolutely will, but I don't want to. So a lot of times, any anytime you hear people making threats, they're threatening something that they don't want to do. And that was certainly the case for me. I don't think I really ever make threats unless I don't want to do it. So that's actually a kind of interesting insight, like into the window of somebody's mind. Is And it's not just me. I think most of the time when people make threats, it's about something they don't want to do. Now, why on earth would that be the case? Why would there? Why would people make threats? I don't want to do this. I don't want to go on some wild monkey chase away from my goal so that I can get past here. What I would really like is for this thing to just disappear. Now, why is that? It's because I'm going to have to spend potentially thousands of gold, when you look at troop attrition and, and what have you, of raiding underwater, right? I'm going to have to spend maybe dozens of gems on underwater breathing items, or, you know, maybe like, let's say 30 gems at least on underwater breathing items. And then all the remotes I'm going to cast on you to destroy your stuff, that may be another 80 or 90 gems. These are all things I don't want to do they're things that are costly. They're things that take me farther away from my goal of trying to do things which will put me in a better position to win the game. But I can't go do other things with the underwater nation fucking with me. And it's better to go ahead and pay up front to get this out of the way and to get them to leave me alone. And, I mean, this will actually weaken them a little bit. So there's a tiny bit of resource denial motivation here too, where if this guy wants to mess with me again in the future, he'll have a bit less resources to do it. But that is like by far and away, by far and away, a minor, minor factor. What I really want him to do, and the reason for the threats, is that if they are credible and the underwater nation believes them, then he might just leave me alone. And this has happened before, too. They say, okay, fine. Or, you know, I mean, they, they honestly could even, and I, I haven't ever seen this done, but this would be clever. Somebody starts giving threats, a logical response would be, okay, well, how about this? I will give you a non-aggression pact, but I want the I want some of the gems that would have been executed to do this, but I'll give you a long one. So I don't know. That would be a funny thing. I feel like, logically, an underwater nation should be able to extort land nations potentially for, I don't know, 10 or 15 gems, 20 gems maybe for a long non-aggression pact, which you would have to trust them because like giving 20 gems to somebody you don't trust, don't know about that. But like paying an underwater nation 15 gems so that you get like a nap three and in addition, they won't mess with you until they have another cap or something. And then after that, it turns into a nap three. Like, I would pay somebody 15 gems for that if I were a coastal neighbor and I was worried about it at all, potentially. I mean, that that would be, I think, a reasonable extort. Because if I don't put anything on the coast, they can take this stuff with very low effort. So I don't know. I probably, I don't know. I think this, this is like kind of interesting game theory, though. So anyway, this is not for resource extraction. This is not for denial. This is for changing their mindset to get a diplomatic outcome. And the reason we do threats is because we don't want to do the thing we're threatening because it's going to take us farther away from our goal. But we will, and we'll do it with vitriol and passion and what have you. And we're hoping, even though it doesn't work a lot of times, we're hoping that the person, upon hearing the threat, will say, yeah, okay, yeah, it's probably not going to work out for my favor. Let's do something else. Now, what is the problem with threats? The problem with threats is if they are potentially good, uh, a good way of getting out of a war you don't want to be in, one that's asymmetrical, which kind of most wars, if you think about it, somebody wants them to be asymmetrical. Nobody wants a symmetrical war, really. Symmetrical wars are like very costly lose-lose things. 
you know, if even a land nation war that you pick in a free for all game, you want it to be asymmetrical. Like I come in and stomp you, right? If it's a symmetrical thing where you're like, you're trading equally. Oh my God, it's so painful. And then, you know, this obviously is asymmetrical, but point being that this applies to land nation wars too, potentially. Like if you want somebody to screw off, you can do this same thing maybe. And we're going to talk about this strategy of getting out of bad land wars, but the problem the problem with threats is basically well first of all if you do them you probably need to carry them out or you're going to have a reputation for not following through on your threats which then they're not very good anymore because given the threat is something you usually don't want to do it's usually going to take you farther away from your goal but the other problem with threats is let's say you're the underwater nation right and you're here you're in a little pond right and you have to figure out which direction you're going to go in are you going to go up and you go up and they give you threats and you're like, okay, I guess we won't do it. And you go this way and you start raiding and they give you threats and you're like, oh God, okay, we can't do it. They're going to, they said they'll do bad things to us. And you go this way, it's like, oh, they're going to do bad things to us too. They've given, they've, everybody I talk to is, or everybody I go poke is giving me the, the ultimatum. You go this way, it's the same thing. You're like, damn it, I can't attack anyone without getting threatened to have my seas burnt to cinders. <laughs> you know, that's a shitty way to be. Right? You can't do your little being an underwater shit. It's not working. So what do you do? Well, you would kind of have to just pick a direction and go in it, maybe, or something like that. You can't do nothing and expect the game to go well for you. And so at some level, you have to assess the, vo the validity of the threats. And ideally, what you want to pick out is you would want to pick out a player who either is incapa incapable of executing the threats right for whatever reason or maybe it's possible if all of them give you threats and they're all credible it is possible they can all make it unprofitable for you to do this underwater rating thing because if you do this underwater rating thing they are each going to make it more expensive for you there if every single one of your land neighbors is willing to take this detour to make it unprofitable for you then this is kind of out for you as a strategy. This is a strategy that's not going to work. And instead, you'll have to have a strategy that much more revolves around this, conquering them like a proper nation. And this, by the way, is interesting because when you think about it, this is not the thing that the underwater launching a proper invasion of a land army, I mean, of a, of a land nation, this is not the thing that people hate about underwater. People hate this other stuff. So it's kind of interesting. If people follow the game theory for dealing with underwater nations well, where they're all making threats, they're all pillaging underwater stuff if they get messed with, and doing all sorts of things like that. If everybody does that, then this strategy for the underwater nation really shuts down. This shuts down super hard. Not a very good strategy. And instead, they have to result to finding a way to actually win a proper war. So that's pretty interesting. And one thing I think you'll notice, if you watch the final, and I, I have no idea, and, you know, Arco has been reasonably quiet in terms of his communication with omniscience. So we don't really have a great window into his mind. However, he has not done very much poke rating. He has not been like, we're going to be an underwater shit. He has not played like an underwater shit at all. And if you think about it, it's possible that whether Arco knows it explicitly or through experience or intuition, that this is not a game he wants to play with a bunch of experienced players being the underwater shit because we know how it turns out potentially. Instead, he's been mostly a pretty safe border for most of the nations. I mean, there's obvious exceptions, like, but the, the, the time he really came out of the water, he went and conquered somebody. So it's kind of interesting, I think, how all of that um, all of that plays out. And if you don't do this strategy of being a little shit underwater raider, this is also looming over all of your land nations. None of the land nations want this because none of the net land nations want to give these threats and none of the land nations want to spend the resources to go burn underwater. This, this, is, this is like a whole path that the land nations don't want. And by not doing it, but being a competent player where everybody knows you've thought about doing it, they are very happy to keep you on their side in diplomacy. 
right? They want to have good relations with you. If for no other reason, then just so that this, they don't have to start seeing if there's some way that you can figure out a way to make rating them economical, you know? And then if you can, then they're going to have to get into this, you know, burn and pillage strategy, which they probably don't want to do because other people aren't going to be doing it and other people are going to be getting closer to winning. So that I think is a pretty good, I, I mean, for me, I think that fully explains how I think about the land underwater rating situation and denying resources, which I, th I think is we're salting the earth. So we've talked about that. What we're going to talk about now is, well, let's, let, let's draw this out real quick. All right. So I've drawn out like a nine player kind of map nuke grid map. I mean, I say I've drawn it out. It's four, it's nine squares. And let's say you're in the middle because you're at the center of your own universe. I'll call you player A and uh, we'll call this player B and then C and then D and so forth. We're not gonna really need to label all, well, whatever, we'll do it. Should do the last one like Z or something just to mess with y'all. So let's say this situation, you're in uh, a nine player game and you have the ability to give up 10 of your resources and deny them. Let's say you just basically have the ability to do a trade where you're minus 10 and you can pick anybody here like this guy and you're, this guy is going to be a minus 10, right? So you do something like this. Is this a good deal? The answer in the previous world over here would be, eh, it's not really good or bad. It's neutral. Over here, it's a positively bad deal. And the reason it's positively bad is because you are now weaker than all of the rest of your neighbors, right? Like... Sure, you denied resources from this guy and it cost you something, but these guys are all lower. Right? On the same token, let's say you found a juicy opportunity. You could only do minus five and this guy could be minus 20. Is this a good deal? Probably not. Because unless everybody else, for whatever reason, took a minus 20 or a minus 5, I mean, yeah, unless everybody else took a minus 5 for some other weird unknown reason, you're putting yourself behind the pack. Because if you do the math, let's get a little calculator here. We've got 9 players, right? And 20 divided by 9 is 2. So the average wealth of everybody else has gone down by... Oh, it shouldn't be divided by nine, it should be divided by eight, it has gone down two and a half. So you've actually, even though you're like, oh, I did a great thing, I screwed over one person, you've actually done a really bad thing. You've actually, the, the wealth of the world, of everybody but you, on average is down by 2.5, and the wealth of you is down by five, right? And so this is why in a free-for-all game, doing lose-lose trades or even like this in a binary world, if we were back here, let's look at the same thing if we were back here in this land, right? You know, maybe I spin gems to destroy part of the population or something. If I do that, it's going to cost me a little and maybe deny this person more. That is a win in the zero sum game world. But this is not the zero sum game world. This is a world in dominions where there's lots of win-wins and there's lots of lose-loses. And just denying something to your enemy does not necessarily benefit you. So that's the first thing that I think is important as we start thinking about uh, game theory in a free-for-all multiplayer game. Is that even though this may seem like a good deal, it's not. Now, a lot of times when we look at like a war in Dominions, wars can be straight up profitable. And by profitable, I mean there can be a lot of undefended land on your territory and you just go out and take it. And it's now like a plus five for you, you know, or like let's say it's a plus 10 and it costs you something, you know, you're not getting it completely for free, but you can, you can get 
land where it will pay you back in a single turn. You're going to lose the amount of attrition you suffered to get it is going to come back in a single turn. And for the guy you took it from, it may be minus 30. Now this, is this good? Should you do this deal? This is a good deal in the, the zero sum world, but it's also a good deal in this world where we have nine players. Because unless other people are finding equally good trades, you're going to be up 10 on everybody else. In fact, the minus 30 doesn't even really matter. The minus 30, if you look at it, is 30 divided by eight. It's, it is the smaller portion of the pie. The fact that you're weakening the global pool of other people out there doesn't really matter that much. What it does matter in is that if you're in a war, the more you're taking away from your enemy, the sooner it is the war is going to be over and the easy it's going, easier it's going to, to be for you to win it is A versus E. So coming in here and you know, doing these trades every turn with E is a great thing to do as A if you can swing it. And I think, I mean, this is obvious. But anyway, this is like kind of what you want a war to look like. Now, sometimes the payoffs in a war may be down the road, right? So you may come in and it may be there's going to be some investment where like the first couple turns, it's going to be zero and minus 20, right? Because the amount of attrition you're taking is such that you're not really coming out ahead when you look at like net value, like how much, what's the net value of your nation? How much wealth have you accrued in terms of your units and your infrastructure and all that? It, it may not actually, the war part of it may not be profitable for you. But what you've lost is short-term attrition and what you've gained is long-term income. And so over time, if you do enough, you're going to be making money. But again, in this situation, you don't want to destroy the enemy land. The whole point of it is to basically get it for yourself. It's the pluses over here that are going to matter, right? It's not really the minuses over here. And also, too, if you like Dominions, but you don't like diplomacy, like you don't like any of this business or thinking about this, you just want to play a war game, like play a 1v1 Blitz. 1v1 Blitzes are kind of fun. And there's no salt. Like you can't be angry, really, at another player because there's no there's no diplomatic backstabbing or anything at all. You can't really be salty. It's like it'd be like getting mad at somebody about a game of chess. Like it's it's ridiculous. So while... It's interesting because Dominions as a like a normal multi like a free for all multiplayer game is like very hard to stay friends with people. <laughs> it's it's like vitriol and venom and backstabbing a lot of times. But Dominions is a 1v1 is which is strange when you think about it cuz in this zero sum world you're actually much more incentivized to be a horrible worse player where you burn stuff to the ground and what, just deny your enemy resources. Like in some ways it encourages like the worst possible player beha behavior, but it's like, there's no venom at all. It's like completely, it'd be like, you know, no, people don't get mad at each other playing 1v1s. At least I haven't seen it. I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure it's happened. You know, like I'm sure somebody's gotten mad at somebody for playing chess. But anyway, yeah. So we've been talking kind of about the what types of trades you want to make in a Dominion style game. And you want to either be doing trades where like in a war type trade where you're getting, you know, plus something either in the short run or in the long term. And, you, you know, it probably is going to have to come from somebody there. Somebody else is going to be getting big minuses. However, there's also in Dominions a ton of opportunities for win-win trades. And what I mean by that, I mean like, let's say I have a lot of air, but I can't really spin them. And I need a lot of nature, but I didn't find any nature sites. But somebody's got a lot of nature, but they need air. To me, the value of those air gems is let's say half of a nature gym. I would never tell them, but that's what their real value to me is. And I wouldn't ever, I probably might not even trade it because I would, even if that was the value to me, I knew other people would need the air gems more than they would need nature. And I would just wait for that person to stick their head up and then we would do the trade, right? But anyhow, the, the true internal value to me is air gems are like half as valuable as nature gems. That would be my true internal value, let's say. I mean, this is like purely hypothetical. A lot of times it can be way smaller. A lot of times it can be like, eh, air gems are like maybe 10% more valuable, 
right? But the point is, is that we can do a trade and I can give him air gems and he can give me nature. And let's say we come out with two, like, and it's a big value for each of us. It's like a plus 20, right? So this is a win-win. The wealth of the board is increased by us just trading resources. There's other types of win-wins you can do where two people like A and D agree to go on E and doing that, it's potentially going to make the war shorter and cheaper. And so then it's going to be you know, more efficient for each of those nations. And then they're going to make some money, you know, if they actually can deliver the goods and kill E without losing major armies. Cause if they do, E's going to invite other people in to kill them. But this is another type of win-win is going into a war together. The other thing is there's kind of a diplomatic currency in a way in a game where you can spend it and then it's gone. Like, let's say you violate a non-aggression pact. You're going to spend a ton of diplomatic currency doing that. People basically aren't going to trust you again. Let's say you violate naps and break them um, and go for a throne rush. That's going to spend a lot of diplomatic currency. People are not going to trust you after that. And those are like the extreme examples of diplomatic currency, but it can be little things. It can be like saying you'll join a war and then you don't. It can be like saying you'll help or something and you won't. It could just be saying... It could just be little petty lies. Like you say, oh, this war is going great, and it's not. It could be saying, you know, every time you do something that decreases the level at which people trust you, you're spending some of that diplomatic currency. And why that's important is because people have to make decisions about who they want to work with. Do they want to work with somebody who is going to be, like, stab them in the back later? Because that would be really unfortunate if you help somebody to get into a good position, like y'all work together. Like, let's say, let's say I know D is the kind of player who's going to stab me in the back when he gets big. And I say, hey, D, let's go on E. We go on D, D, uh, we go on E, D gets really big. And then later in the game, he stabs me in the back. And I'm like, damn it. And by stab in the back, I don't mean just like declares war on me or something. I mean, you know, like violates a non-aggression pact and attacks me or maybe it, there's a bunch of ways to do it where it's kind of not very, like, it's not very friendly, you know, like, and not to say it's wrong, but like that could just be the kind of agent, if we want to think about it that way, that player D is. They'll talk me into helping them with C, but they now own part of D, right? So D comes down like this, right? And they, they talk me into helping him with C. And for whatever reason, we don't have a non-aggression pact yet or something, right? And I help with C, and then he comes in and attacks me, and it turns into a 2v1 against, against me. And he hadn't been planning this with C. C didn't want to do a 2v1 with D against me, but he talks me into joining a 2v1 against C, and then he comes in and attacks me, right? Like, if this player... I know is doing those kind of things. And let's say player F, they're pretty trustworthy. They do what they say. They'll attack me if I get too big or something, or if it makes sense or whatever, but they're not going to do like weird backstabby betrayal things. They're not going to throne rush, violate naps and throne rush, something like that. If I had the choice, which of those guys do I want to help? there's a good chance I'm going to say, hey, let's do a win-win trade with F. Because a win-win trade with F will mean we get to go on E, we're going to come out ahead, and I haven't empowered through the win-win trading, I haven't empowered somebody who um, is going to be, you know, be a, a big betrayer, basically. There's other things too, like you wanna be a little careful if somebody's like a really good player about how much you empower them. And you certainly, I mean, I think the biggest thing is even more than the player, like if somebody, like let's say D has eaten C, and so this is all D now, right? This whole thing is D. And let's say D's trustworthy and fine, right? Do I want to invite them to help me eat E if I'm only like a, a one state rump state? I mean, ideally, no. You know, I might need to if E, and this is what you'll see, people, like if E fends me off, I would probably be more inclined to say, okay, E, you've, you've defended our 1v1, let's go back to peace. I would be more inclined to do that than I would be to say, D, come in and help me eat E. However, if E was attacking me, We're going off on a bit of a rabbit trail, but if E was attacking me and they were thinking they were going to grind me down and I've killed a bunch of their big armies, but they're still committed to attacking me, 
it would probably be still worth it to get these guys to come in, even though it's going to make the game state fucking horrible, because D is going to be this enormous empire, right? Anyway, what is the summary of this last little bit? The summary of this last little bit is that there's a diplomatic currency in trust matters, and in general, in a game like Diplomacy, where you're potentially, like, in a game like Dominions, or Diplomacy, it's not, a, a lot of times people focus on the betrayal and the backstabbing part. But the win-wins that you do are oftentimes more important. The trading you're doing, the working together, the, the information sharing, that's another thing I didn't mention. Like people who are willing to share good information with you and you share it back with them, that's also a big win-win. So having diplomatic currency, like getting, being friendly with people is of immense value in a Dominions game. And it is another reason why if you can avoid it, not doing lose-loses with people. Because if I do a lose-lose right here, like let's say I go minus 20 and this guy goes minus 20, and let's say back in the end game, this would have been my attack on Ashdod. I have done diplomatic damage with the Ashdod player. I have hurt his position. I've hurt mine. And we're both fucked, not from a decision he made, but from a decision I made. And what I want to do when I'm talking to the Ashdod player is as much as I can say, I'm very sorry about this. I did not mean this. And what I'm trying to do by doing that is I'm trying to reduce the diplomatic penalty for me being a complete dumbass, right? Even though going back and looking at it in hindsight, we can see why it looked like a, a good idea, <laughs> but it was not. It was a bad idea or I did it wrong. Anyhow, yeah, the, you know, so you're going to have to do things to, like, especially anytime you're going to execute a war. Like, when I did that thing against Ashdod, I was hoping it was going to be a plus 10, minus 30. Right? But it wasn't. It was like a minus 20, minus 20. So, you you know, to do these war endeavors, you're going to have to do things which are going to screw over other players to a bit. Right? This is the game, right? You're trying to find these kind of scenarios so that you can improve your position in the game. But you don't want to spread the... Like, you, you want... Like, me doing this and screwing over E a little bit, which, I mean, let's be clear, like, attacking Ashdod was screwing him over, but that, I mean, every, almost every war, there's a, there is a zero-sum game aspect to this, where, you know, this is not a win-win, this is a win-lose, and, and as you can see, it may even be a net negative, like, between the two of us, we're coming out minus 20, but I'm hoping I come out at least plus 10, right? So... You know, there is a zero-sum game aspect to this. What I don't want to have happen is, is much like once I've realized this is going to be a bad trade, I want to mitigate as much of the diplomatic damage as I can. And the reason is very simple. The reason is because diplomatic currency has value. Like, I don't want to piss this player off because they may be an important trading partner, ally in a coming war. I think in the case of this particular end game, if we we're looking at Ashdod, we, I think I, this early war with him, I think actually did do a fair amount of diplomatic damage in the sense that I don't think we ever worked together in a war after that. I had invited him to Vulture Satis after Satis was dead and he took me up on that. But we all, he also attacked me at one point later in the game when it seemed like a good opportunity and I think I killed all of his armies. But I also had no interest in attacking into him. I had had enough of that from that previous fight. And, but we, we had, a, we had established trust for each other because I had been reasonable and respectful with him, I think, or whatever. And we went back to peace immediately after his invasion of me failed. And this was like 20 or something turns later. But the point is that even though we were fighting, even though we had a lose-lose, there's a ton of value in trying to keep it as friendly as you can to keep as much of the, the diplomatic kind of currency on the table as you can. And for that reason, that's, you know, if you if you were to say there's this one strategy, I don't even know if it's, I hesitate to call it a strategy, right? But there's a, a school of thought. We've had some people come into like uh, the Bosmos games that were of this school of thought that... Basically, when you're done expanding, you go and just you start attacking people. Like, wherever it is, if you see unguarded land, just take it. Because why, if you have a standing army that you're paying upkeep for, would you not take unguarded land? These players get eliminated so goddamn fast. This is the worst strategy. Unless 
unless you're in a game of new players who don't know how to defend themselves and you have a decent idea of how to play the game, and especially if you have good sacreds, you might, especially on a smaller map, be able to run over people. What happens with competent players is they just kill you. Because <laughs> now you've, what you've done is you've made C find out who I and E and G are, and they decide, okay, well, let's just send armies at them and kill them. And what you discover as player A is that Oh, those lands weren't exactly undefended. They just didn't have troops in them at the time. So that's one reason to not do this is because the combined military power of these people, if they all decide to attack you, is pretty high and they will squish you. The other reason that it's way better to go in one war if you can, especially at the beginning, later in the game, as your resources increase, you might be able to not only manage a two-front war, but a two-front war may be optimal for you because it's going to allow you to grow faster. But a lot of times, the reason why a one-front war is preferable is not only because the net military assets of your single enemy is going to be relatively small compared to what it would have been if you were fighting two people, but because by doing this, you're also damaging as little of your diplomatic currency as possible. If you were to do little slights against everybody, you're ruining a ton of your diplomatic currency. And what that's going to mean is when people are looking at who to fight, your name is going to be at the top of a lot of lists, even if you're not actively fighting them. Like, you know, let's say you attacked everybody and pillaged it and then left, but you didn't have it, like you weren't in an active war and you said, okay, you can take it back, but I'm gonna burn it to the ground or something. And you did that to a bunch of neighbors. Like you overexpanded, and then once you would take it, once your overexpanded provinces that you knew you, you would have to give back because they were like some, near somebody's capital, you burnt them to the ground and then you left. Like, why wouldn't you do that? In the zero sum game world, that would be a great strategy. You overexpand here, you know he's going to have stuff that he's going to be able to come back and take it. This is just a small force. Of course, you're going to sit here and pillage it. Why wouldn't you? But over here, if you take that same zero-sum mindset um, into like a free-for-all game and you overexpand into people and you burn this to the ground and then you burn some stuff over here and you burn some stuff over here, you're not in an active war. You said, okay, you can have it back or whatever. You've done a ton of like diplomatic currency type damage and you've also identified yourself as being what I will call a spider. You just, you see the world through this zero-sum lens, right? Like you're always in this mindset that anything you do to damage any enemy, like you don't realize you're in a free-for-all game. You think you're in this game and you're not, you're in a free-for-all game. And people having this person, like somebody who thinks they're here as your neighbor is very, very shitty because they will do things like, they'll be like, oh, they have like something here that I could hit and kill. And they'll just do it. Because why not? Because I can design, deny resources from this player. So generally the strategy you want to take is you want to minimize, you want to get as much of the, the pluses you can get, whether it's through win-wins or in a war where you're doing a win-lose, you want to get a lot of pluses and you want to do that while mitigating as much as you can any of kind of like the diplomatic currency loss among people around you. And now we're going to get back into the resource denial part a bit more. So. Given all this is a backdrop for how this free-for-all game is very different than a 1v1 for, like, trades and for, you know, what kind of trades you want to make. By trade, I mean, you know, like, minus 10, minus 10, is that a good thing? Or a minus 10, minus 20. That also, by the way, is pretty good context back over here looking at this underwater thing and this path away from victory. In other words, we may be having to do this, but because we're doing these minus minus, these lose-lose trades, which is what by this is, this is a lose-lose, by doing this, we're getting farther and farther away from victory. But we're doing it, you know, with the hope of fixing this roadblock. Okay, so let's say that you were player F, right? And player A has is over here, and they have a fort. And they have a fort right here. And you know, because the armies of player A are not right there, you can come in, and you can take this fort. 
Now, you may be in a very similar situation to the underwater nation. And an underwater minute, we didn't actually cover this as an exact example, but in many ways, this diagonal could be very similar to an underwater nation because a sane player A is probably not going to want an a grid nuke, like a, in a grid style map like map nuke, is probably not going to want to come over here and kill you. They're not going to want to fully invade because we talked about in this other video all the reasons why a diagonal war is really is a horrible idea in almost every circumstance. So you could come over here and take this fort and deny it from A, right? So like, let's say you come over here and you take it. How much have you improved your position on the board as F by doing that? You, you probably haven't improved it very much. You've probably improved it almost none, like zero. But you might have caused like a minus 10 or a minus 20 to player A, right? So at first glance, you might look at it and you may, might be like, okay, this is an okay trade because, sh and by the way, this doesn't actually cost zero because, you know, you have to mobilize an army to take a fort and all of this jazz. It probably is going to cost you a fair amount uh, just to take it even. And there's also the opportunity cost of sending an army to take it. You could have been doing something else. anyway. But you may look at this and you may think, okay, well, this is a, a decent trade, right? Because I'm, of everybody else but me, I'm going to be doing, you know, they are going to be losing 20 divided by 8. Right, so 2.5, I've basically, I've decreased everybody else by 2.5 and I've increased me, well, it, which is effectively the same as an increase for me for 2.5. That's if you're looking at it as, you know, not as a zero sum game even. A zero sum game person, which is I think the only type of person who might consider such a move, a spider, if you will, will, will look at this as the, the 20 and the zero. But even if you were to look at it not as a zero, not as a zero sum, and look at it in this broader free-for-all context, you would look at it as, you know, like a minus 2.5 and a zero, and you might be like, okay, this is a good thing to do. So you come in and you do it, and you destroy the fort. The predicament that this puts player A in is very similar to the predicament that we're back here with this underwater nation. It's this asymmetrical war. And basically, they're in a situation where if I build this fort back, like in my case is in, this was a bitch mother fort. And so I was going to build it back. If I build it back, I would have to keep a standing army to defend it. Right? Um, because if I don't, nothing in this player's head has changed. If he did this and he thought this was a good move and he destroyed the fort and he came, he went and left and I built the fort back and I went and got involved in some other war. What do you guys think the odds are that he would do it again? They're very, very, very fucking high. I'm just going to tell you, they're super high. And even if he told me he wouldn't do it, I wouldn't trust it for shit. Because nothing has changed in his head. And, yeah. And I, I mean, I don't know anything into the mindset of a particular human being. But I'm just going to say in general, from playing tons and tons of Dominions games, people tend to do what they've been doing until there is something major that makes them stop. So he comes over here, he takes it. This in his mind is a great trade, right? He leaves, you build the fort back, you get involved in something else. And he's like, oh, there's this fort here, right? I'm going to come take it. Now, if you're player A, you may anticipate that. You may say, I know this fucker is going to come over here and take this fort the moment he can. So I'm now going to come a small army here, you know, like 40 troops and 10 mages, and they're going to guard this fort in case something comes back. Well, then we're actually in a very similar situation where we were here with static defenses on the ocean front. And there's a big problem with static defenses, which is if this is a little far off corner of your empire and you have a static defense here, he just rolls up with like a 300 person army and 20 mages. And it's like, man, if you give me the opportunity to kill 10 of your mages and 30 of your troops and destroy your whole fort with my troops, like, of course I would do this, right? And... If you're in the zero sum mindset, he's like, look, I'm going to get not only a minus 20, this time it's going to be a minus 30. I'm going to get even more stuff out of it. Don't mind the fact I don't get anything. That doesn't matter because I have a zero sum mindset, right? I'm denying resources from the enemy, right? 
So they come in and they take, and it was actually kind of interesting. John Ahito commented on the last video. He was the, the Ashdod player, but he was saying they were, that these guys actually kind of were planning that, that they were going to, you know, maybe come back in when he and Satis fought me at a later date. And he actually did while I was, well, it was right after Satis died pretty fast after that video. Uh, and by the way, you know, like Satis doing totally logical things. And it was also not, it's not really Satis's fault for not listening to me because every, you know, whenever you get in a war, people are going to say it's not going to go well for you if they want to get out of it. I guess the difference was that I was just right, you know, which I might not have been, you know, it's possible it couldn't have gone my way. But anyhow, yeah, so... Once the Satis War got over, I think that's when Yenohito attacked me again, and then I repelled it. But however, the monkeys had previously told him that they were going to, you know, help with this. And so I have every, especially after hearing that and then other thing. I mean, just, I didn't even need to hear it, though. I, I know mostly, I think, how players work. And if he was operating under this view where he thought this was a good move, then this would also be a good move. And I think you just have to assume... That unless something changes, like unless somebody actually gets educated, like they have a you know, that switch flips in their head, that they're going to keep doing good moves. And they, th they thought the first thing was a good move, they'll think the second thing is a good move. And so then you get stuck in this paradox. Do you stick like a standing army here, which can be defeated? And standing armies, like a static standing army is a very, very bad. Do I stick that here and wait for this to happen and try? The problem then is like, what do I do? Do I go off and start another war? If I start another war, like let's say I went and attacked Satis because for whatever, I wouldn't have. But let's say that's what I thought my next war target, that my most logical war target would be. If I go do that, then these guys are going to come in and stab me and take my fort as soon as it's... Because honestly, an attack against Satis, I would have needed a lot of the stuff I had... Yeah, I probably wouldn't have even been able to put much of a standing army here. It would have been a pretty pittance crew. He would have come back in and, and fucked with me again. And for me, I really needed this fort because it had bitch mothers. But we're getting a little bit away from the, the game theory side of it as I'm talking about the practical parts of it. So it, we're actually in this very similar situation where it's asymmetrical because this player is doing moves they think are good because they have a zero-sum mindset. And for me, like if it was player E doing this... I would just go conquer them or like have a proper war. I might lose the war, right? But I would just like have a proper war with them and we would settle it that way. There wouldn't be any conflict, but it's the asymmetrical part where there's basically, it's basically like this is an ocean and one of the players knows it's an ocean barrier and the other player doesn't. <laughs> but, but yeah, because I, there's not really an incentive to conquer and hold land. And for these guys, their operating view is this is a good trade because I'm denying resources from my enemy and it's not costing me too much. The logical move actually is what we did. And so what I did was actually the a move to win the game, but it was in a long, very painful... It was not a move I wanted to make. It was this, right? And I had to show the monkeys that there was a cost to burning my fort and we had to punish them. And what's very interesting is after they were punished, they never messed with me again, not for the rest of the game. They learned that actually this was a very bad trade for them. What it ended up being was it was like a minus 50. And for me, it was like a minus 40. Right? But if I didn't do it, I was going to get the minus stuff anyway. The, I already gotten a minus 20. There's going to be another minus 20 coming until I had convinced them that this wasn't a bad idea. They thought what they did was right and logical. And if you talk to them, they'll probably will still try to defend their actions. Anyway, this can happen in many shapes and forms. This can happen without forts. Let's say some player is dropping remotes at you. Anybody that has a worldview like of the... Anybody that has this worldview that denying resources from your enemy is essentially the same as getting them for yourself, which as we've talked about is a flawed worldview in this concept, like in this framework of a game. But anybody that has, you know, with an asterisk there, there's times where, you know, especially in the late game when there's only a few players, that worldview becomes more and more true. But, but yeah, they can chunk remotes at you, right? So they can do all of these horrible remotes we were talking about doing underwater. People could just, there's nothing in the game that stops people from casting them at you, right? So D could come over here and do minus 20, minus 40. 
And if D is of the idea, because the remotes cost things, you can't do things for free, especially magic and dominions. If D is of this mindset that, you know, we're zero sum, then this is a good trade, right? But this actually is a bad trade for D because it cost him something and it doesn't net out for the world. And furthermore, it puts A in this same situation. Let's say this is a horror cannon going off. Let's say he's sending horrors at you. Anytime you have something like a mage running around or a small army, anything, he's not at war with you. He doesn't neighbor you. Anytime you have something running around, he's like, oh, well, I can spend 10, so minus 10. And this is pretty juicy you've got. This is going to be minus 30. And he's just going to do that. And why wouldn't you do that? This seems like a great trade. Minus 10 for minus 30. Right? This is a lose-lose, though, and this is in a big free-for-all game. And the problem with that is it actually is a bad trade, and the player A is then forced into a very similar situation that we had down here. He can go off and try to execute a war with one of his other neighbors, let's say this guy or this guy or this guy or this guy. Um, he can go off and try to execute a war with them, but while having D take shots at him. Now, the only answer to that is not to just come in here and attack D through a diagonal. There are other answers. You can potentially get one of the neighbors to attack D. But let's say that D has positioned himself to the other neighbors that, hey, this is great. I'm just going to sit here and throw shit at A. And that's going to be, you know, that's how I'm going to improve my position in the game. I'm just, there's so, A is giving me so many juicy opportunities to throw horrors at him. We'll just do that. And that way, that's how we're going to win. And C and D are like, oh my god, this guy's an idiot, but he's a gloriously useful idiot for us. You know, we'll just accept that, right? They don't want to attack him. They, this is like the most useful idiot they've ever had. So they don't want to attack him, and D's busy firing off whatever it is into A. So you're like, what do you do? You can't go execute some other war with somebody doing this, and... You could think of it too. It doesn't even have to be horrors. It could be somebody casting like unrest rituals at you or, you know, population killing rituals or disease rituals at you. Every turn that you have where you're not dealing with it is kind of a turn that you're going to be suffering, you know, significant minuses. Now it's possible, like let's say he's doing like blight at you. Blight isn't like a horrible thing, but you know, he can potentially cast it like two or three times a turn if he's trading his gems to get the right gem type and all of that. You know, he could be doing a minus 20 every turn. It's possible if you have very productive other wars, you could be getting a plus 30. And so it's possible that while somebody's peppering you with this stuff, you just ignore it. And like, okay, well, I'm going to trade well enough. Nobody else is getting a plus 10 trade. So I'll just do these plus 30s and I'll accept the minus 20. It's hard to do that, guys. It's hard to do that. And it's going to depend a lot on the strength of your neighbors and stuff, but it's really hard to trade that well. A lot of times what you're going to want to do is you're going to have to turn this source off. And furthermore, even if the source turns off, like especially if it's like the horrors, if the horrors turn off, it might just be there's nothing juicy here for the horrors to hit, and they're going to wait for something juicy, and then they'll just do it again. Do you really want to... There's a huge incentive to get this guy out of the game, to have it, or to have some kind of assurance that it's not going to happen again. And that might mean you have to do a diagonal war into him. But will you be able to keep land you have in a diagonal war? Probably not, unless you were to carve your way through one of the neighbors, then you might be able to keep some of it. And then we are back in this thing, right? Which is, we are doing a backtrack here to get to where we want to go. So I, I think this gets us, we've in some ways gone a little bit full circle because whereas here in the ocean, spiting was really a form of punishment to create asymmetry. I mean, to create symmetry in an asymmetrical war. And so you may say like, what is the difference between a land nation pillaging and burning or destroying forts underwater. What is the difference between this? And what is the difference between what is the difference between this pillaging stuff underwater to establish symmetry? And what is the difference between F coming in out of the blue 
and pillaging stuff here, right? Or what is the difference between D out of the blue casting remotes here and, and damaging you? And there's actually a very big difference. And the difference is what the goal is. For these players, for D and F in this situation, the goal is resource denial. And that's because they are in this world where they're thinking, uh, I've denied things from the enemy and I've therefore improved my position. The goal over here in underwater is creating symmetry and it's a diplomatic outcome. And what is interesting about this is that if you were to come over here, so let's say these casting remotes and you come over here and burn and pillage their stuff, or maybe you fire back even more remotes at them, aren't you just doing the same thing? Aren't you just two versions of each other? And the answer is not really, actually. The answer is that one person thinks they're getting, they actually, in their mind, it's logical. In their mind, this, you know, minus 10, minus 20 is a great deal for them. They're flawed in their thinking, but this is a good deal for them. However, once you come over here and you start burning and destroying their shit, whether it's through spells or pillaging or armies, this is no longer a minus 10. Now this is minus 50, minus 50. This is not what they signed up for. This for player A may be more painful in the short run because he's not only going to be suffering the losses of the stuff coming at him, but he's also going to potentially suffer the cost of moving an army up here and any attrition he's going to have to inflict these damages or the cost of spells to do similar things. So the cost is not insignificant and it is a cost which moves you farther away from your goal, which is getting in a position where you could, you know, win the game or be stronger, closer to winning the game, getting a higher position in the game. It moves you away from that goal. But it, you are in some ways forced into that by the actions of the other player because you need to turn the spiting off. And the way to turn the spiting off is by spending resources to show them that this actually is a true lose-lose because it was already a lose-lose, but the other player didn't see it that way because they have this mindset. But once the costs on their side escalate, they realize that it's actually a bad idea. So in summary, spiting or let's say salting the earth can be done in many different situations for many different effects. And some of them have value in winning the game and others do not, I guess, is maybe the better way to say it. Sometimes you need to do it to establish a symmetry in a relationship. And sometimes you need to do it to make a cost of a war sufficient that um, other people aren't going to continue persecuting it. And, and sometimes it is not always, but sometimes it is done when somebody has this zero sum mindset and they have started spiting you and you have to return it to them. Otherwise they are going to stay and keep doing what they think are these extremely profitable trades which really are just screwing both of you over. So there's one other thing I want to address, which is like, why, why don't... We've, we've talked about it some, but like, why don't we see more remotes or like the spiting or salting in like a land over land battle or resource denial? And, and usually the reason is because you want the land for yourself. The other reason is, is a lot of things like, Whereas underwater, sometimes it's more efficient to, like, it's more efficient to deny resources through spells or what have you than it is to raid for a land nation. On land, a lot of times raiding is way, way, way more profitable than any kind of resource denial. So like getting land for yourself, you get, you know, some money back and it's usually cheaper than it would be to destroy something. And so usually these spells don't get used hardly at all. Like the population destroying stuff, they really don't get used much on, in land versus land things. And for good reason, because it's not a good idea. 
because it's way better almost always to just go out and raid or take something right so oh there's one more thing i wanted to say which is that so while salting the land can be a tool for basically creating symmetry in an asymmetrical relationship what's interesting is that if you do it unprovoked which this also applies underwater. Like we could pretend D here is the underwater nation or not. Under, let's we'll, we'll pretend A is the underwater nation. If you're the land nation and you just start like assaulting the seas before the underwater nation has done anything to you, you have basically from this right. So let's say here, well, we'll just go to this. Let's say A has started, he anticipates that this underwater play is going to be a shit. And so he starts dropping remotes and nukes on them and whatever, just to say, fuck you underwater, fuck you, right? Like that's, that's his view from the beginning of the game. If you do this, you are basically being just like D hawking shit at A. And you've created the same situation that A had that we were describing a minute ago, except this case it would be the underwater nation. And they basically have to create a cost for D because right now D is in this mindset that the rate, like the, if, if D was doing that, they would be saying the reason I'm casting these remotes at you isn't for a diplomatic outcome. It's because I want to do the resource denial part. Fuck under, we're going to deny them resources, right? And if they are doing that, that's the wrong reason to do that. As I was explaining, the reason to do it is for a change of mindset, which will beget a change in diplomatic situations. If if they do that, if they are chunking that shit into A, A has to create cost symmetry. Like they need, you are going to require the underwater nation to start making this expensive for you to doing it to them. Right? So we then get, I think, the situation that people who play Dominion's games a fair amount will be pretty familiar with. And that is, you have your hand on the big nuclear button, right? Like you have the, the, the tools to salt the earth, right? You can salt it, but you don't want to. And the reason you don't want to is because you don't want the other person to have to do the same thing. Because you know the second that you get in a loot, like a salting war with some other person, like where you're salting them and they're salting you back, that kind of you know, lose-lose is going to be great for everybody else in the game that isn't you two. And so you want to steer clear of it. Like when uh, I black death Yis after he attacked me underwater, which actually that's a kind of interesting thing because I attacked him and then he said, I, I black death them. And then, he, which is one of these cancer remotes that destroys a bunch of population. And I black death them. And then he basically said he would leave me alone. And that was in conjunction with also making the rating expensive and winning uh, some big battles. It wasn't like the black death alone stopped him. But the net effect of all of that was like, he's, you know, okay, this is not worth it. I'm going to go do something else, which is the point of that. But I was thinking we were preparing that for yes, not really anticipating he would attack us. But because it, the other time that these situations where you're going to do a lose-lose, like a minus 20, minus 40, which is what black deathing you can think of is, uh, the other time this can make sense, it wasn't my death gems. It was all of the top players had pulled them. It was, in fact, mostly from Ur. And it was those death gems that was going... Basically, it was a bunch of these players had contributing something to knocking one player down a peg or two. And if somebody's really, really, really running away with the game, like completely out of control, things like that can start to look like they might make sense. And so that was one of the things I was a little worried about in the Relay game, like maybe people are going to start black deathing me because normally it wouldn't make sense. But when somebody starts getting really out of control, which I was in the Relay game, it makes sense. Or in the case of the, the Ohm game, you know, Yes was just super out of control. And so we were looking at doing that there. And the reason in particular we looked at doing it with Yes was to shut down more Vark production, which, so anyway, this was just a measure to control somebody who was like completely running away with the game. So that's the other time you can kind of look to salt the earth. I think my advice for people getting into the multiplayer scene is save underwaters for create, I mean, save salting the earth for making something that is asymmetrical symmetrical.
right? So save it for like the underwater type of thing. That's a good time to do it. If you're ever in a duel, like a 1v1, a true 1v1, or it gets to the late game where it's you and another guy, don't feel bad about using them. They're reasonable tools. But while you're in the free-for-all portion of the game, it's not a very good idea. And try as much as you can to not piss off a bunch of people. That would be my advice. Anyway, I'm sure not anybody is going to agree with everything. And some people aren't going to agree with a lot. And a lot of you have probably, hopefully, hopefully my wish in this is that a lot of you find something interesting, useful, thought-provoking that you can use in your games. And I think for me in making this, I, I don't want to pretend that I don't see red because sometimes I see red because I think as a personality type or like an agent type, I, I am, I am definitely of the punisher type. Like I'm, I'm not going to let somebody chunk shit at me and then let that be okay. Right. There will be a cost. And part of this is things I've learned from experience where people that do this are going to do it again. And it's very hard to get yourself in a good position when you're having people willing to make lose-lose trades with you. I really don't like having lose-lose people in the game that are looking at me. If they're lose-lose being a peg against somebody else, it's pretty easy for everybody to ignore that until it's being done to you. But I think, I mean, as a mindset, I think I am biased. So like in the case of Bandar Log, I think a proportional response would be actually exactly what I did, which was destroying the fort and pillaging as much land around it as I could. But I was not going to stop there. I was going to keep going and destroy their capital. And the reason I didn't was because Satis called me home. So that was, I think the, the thing there was like me wanting to go on to Bandar Log was like me seeing red. And I was seeing red because I was, I did not, I mean, guys, I did not want to take this fucking detour. This was not something I wanted to do, but I had to do it for the logic I've laid out. You may not agree with it, but that was why I thought I had to do it. And come to find out after the fact, he probably would have come back in and stuff anyway. But I was seeing red. I would have probably gone after Bandalek's capital. So for me, being able to lay all this out and kind of what I hope is more clear, rational articulation of kind of game theory and logic, I think it will help me see through like, the color blinders. So like, when is it that we've gone too far? So like going after Bandar's cap, the thing is once I burned the fort and pillaged a bunch of land, that is enough to let the Bandar the player and killed his army, that there is a cost to fuckery, right? So he got it, the switch had been flipped. And so if he wanted peace, if I had asked him, okay, is that enough? After I burned his fort and killed his army. And he said, yes, that's fine. Will you go home? And I said, yes. I would have a lot of confidence that he probably is not going to be coming back through there unless somehow his diagonal war ambitions where he thinks he can actually conquer me are rekindled, but he's not going to come back over to fuck with me. He'll come back over maybe if he, if he really wants the diagonal war where he can conquer me and take my cap. So, but yeah, uh, I think after I conquered that fort, he would have said yes and I would have fucked off and gone back here and yeah it which is basically it's what happened anyway because of satis but i i think being able to articulate the logic because i think I, I had always had the logic but it was a little bit hidden under a lot of the the rage and emotion i think being able to articulate the logic is very helpful um, not only for like calming some of the rage at times but also uh, to go back to this analogy not this analogy this picture this by the way is burning Bandar's fort. This is the point I have to get to right here to burn Bandar's fort. This is going to Bandar's capital, right? I didn't end up taking this course, but I fucking would have. Oh boy, would I have. And if I could go do it again, I wouldn't have dodged this route. I wouldn't have not gone, like in the calmness and coolness of reason, I would have not not done what I did to go burn the fort and pillage the land. I would have done all that. But this would have been a fucking mistake. And I would have done this in the moment out of rage. So I think understanding the logic for this a little bit better is helpful for knowing, like, what to do. And here, what I needed to do was to do enough damage that I could be certain that he really, 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 really did not want to mess with me again. There are other ways. I didn't mention this in the previous video that you can do that. And now, and I checked those ways. So once he first burned my fort, I was like, okay, dude, I really don't want to have to come in here 
and go conquer you. Like, I, I, I mean, and burn your stuff. I'm going to. I really don't want to, but I'm going to. Please pay me the value of the fort you just destroyed. And it's going to suck for me because I'm going to have to take the time to rebuild the infrastructure. It's still a loss. But pay me the value of the fort and I won't come through and kill your army and burn your fort. And he's like, no. Because in his mind, he had just done an awesome trade and he didn't want to make it a bad trade. Like, he had done a great trade, which was like, you know, like minus two or whatever the cost of the upkeep of the army was. And then minus like 30 for me for the fort. And he's like, that was, I just made a great deal. If you make me pay for the value of the fort, then you're going to be plus 30. So you're going to be back to zero. And then I'm going to be minus 30. And that's a bad fucking deal for me in the zero sum world. So he's like, nope, not going to do it. You have to listen to what people tell you. He's basically telling me that he still thought what he did was a good deal. Little did he know that he had like a minus 100 coming for him. Or he got a bunch of land pillaged, his army destroyed, and his fort killed. Which is what I said I would do. And you know, it's possible too that he could have defended himself. If he defended himself, it doesn't put us into the realm of like a win-win. There was no... This whole path was a lose-lose. But... Anyway, it, it would have been worse for me, certainly, if he defended himself. <laughs> I would have had trouble holding off Satis. I mean, well, not that's not true, because we held off Satis with what we had. But I certainly wouldn't have been able to conquer Satis without that army coming back from Bandarlog, which it wouldn't have come back if he killed it. So yeah, I think it's helpful for me to articulate this, to know, like, how far should one go... And the answer is, you go far enough to flip the switch to get the diplomatic outcome. It could have been even, maybe I could have even gotten off the train a bit earlier, if I had come in here and laid siege to his fort, and it was before the battle, and I say, you've got like a 3,000 gold army inside this fort I'm about to kill. I'm about to destroy your fort. I could have, and this might have been like the Jedi move, would have been like, pay me 3,000 gold, and you get to keep the army in the fort. You can, I'll put you on a payment plan. But the army's not going to disappear, the fort won't destroy, and I'm not going to kill the lab. You know, do you want to do that deal? If he did that deal, then that would signal to me that the switch is flipped. And it would also be some compensation for me for having to march my army all the way over here. So that would be... But I think the important thing in this type of situation is the payment indicates that they understand that they were wrong, kind of. And that's important because that's what you're going after. They have to understand through paying something that they were wrong. And that's how you know they won't do it again. So that's why you punish them. So that you flip the switch in their head and they don't do it again. And the, I know some people are going to put it like, oh, is this a metagame thing? I mean, there's, there's like, you can't, like Dominions is a game where you play lots of games and a lot of times it's with the same people. So there's always in every single part of Dominions a metagame thing. But there's also, this was not a detour from the single player, I'm not from the single, from the single game thing. This was still, I had to get, you know, like when you're fighting, Underwater's fucking with you, you still have to sometimes go on this detour. You don't want to go on it, but sometimes you have to. In my opinion, it's the same for the Bandar situation. And we had it from the horse's mouth. He was probably going to come back and fuck with me again. But he didn't. He he learned his lesson. So I this was a controversial topic in, in the previous video. I was like super salty. I mean, that was probably the point of it a little bit was to, to decompress and to get some of that out. As a side effect, it ended up being something helpful to think. It ended up being stimulating in a way to, to think through and have to articulate all of the reasons for all the issues people came up with it. And that's kind of what I'm sharing back here with you. And I, I don't know if it was helpful or not, but hopefully it was. Hopefully it was. There's a decent chance it just pisses people off too. So in that case, sorry if this is rage inducing for you, but we will see you next time. Take care.